Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Hirschfeld. I'm sorry, everyone is <laughs> thrilled to know. You don't have to thank you. <laughs> um, and I want to thank BBRF for having me here today. Um, I'm humbled to share the podium with such a distinguished group of researchers. Um, as we know, technology is developing very quickly. It's hard to keep up, and there are many opportunities for integration of technology into clinical care. But in integrating technology into a treatment, it's important that we first understand if it works and how it works. So today, I'm going to talk about using virtual reality in the treatment of social anxiety disorder in youth. So I'd like to start by talking about a young man that I've been working with for the last few years. His name is Josh. He's 19 years old. And he struggled with anxiety since his early teens. He said that his anxiety significantly worsened when he started college last year. He reported feeling anxious in a variety of situations, walking around campus, sitting in large lecture halls where he might be called upon to participate, and at parties, which uh, got even worse after he asked a young woman out in front of his friends and he was rejected. After that, every time he went to a party, he immediately would go into a corner and start playing a game on his phone to avoid interacting with people, or he would drink heavily to avoid the sensation of anxiety. Over time, he stopped going to parties altogether, he stopped interacting with his peers, stopped going to classes, and eventually ended up spending all of his time in his dorm room, sometimes uh, not leaving for days at a time. And this led to the need for him to withdraw academically from his sophomore year. Unfortunately, Josh's story is actually not that uncommon. Anxiety disorders represent the most common psychiatric diagnosis in this country, with social anxiety disorder having a lifetime prevalence of 8.6%. Social anxiety disorder is associated with risk for developing major depressive disorder and substance use disorders, and an array of significant functional impairments, including failure to meet important occupational, academic, and social milestones. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess this isn't working. OK. Now can you hear me? I'm so sorry about that. Here, take it. Take it off. I'll hold it. OK. There we go. OK. Better? Great. The good news is we have treatments that work. The Child Adolescent Anxiety Multimodal Study, or CAMS, found that uh, there's an 81% response rate for a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the frontline psychotherapeutic treatment for anxiety, and an SSRI, which is the frontline um, medication for, for anxiety. Unfortunately, as you can see, cognitive behavioral therapy alone only yielded a 60% response rate, which means that 40% of individuals are not getting better, even with the best psychotherapeutic treatment that we have. Furthermore, cognitive behavioral therapy can be difficult to access for large portions of the country, especially for children and adolescents, because there aren't many well-trained clinicians who specialize in child and adolescent anxiety. Additionally, it's important to note that even in that 60% that responded, it was found that many of the adolescents in that group didn't show as robust a response to exposure therapy, which is the most important component of cognitive behavioral therapy, which we'll discuss a little bit later. In order to understand the underlying mechanisms of response to cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, relapse, potentially, we turn to the animal literature. Research from Francis Lee's lab looks at fear acquisition and extinction in mice and non-anxious humans. It applies the principles of Pavlovian learning and uses a fear extinction learning paradigm, which pairs a non-threatening cue with an aversive stimulus so, such that a fear response is learned. Then the cue is repeatedly presented without the aversive stimulus so that the fear, is, the fear response is extinguished. As you can see, I don't know how to use this. As you can see, adolescent mice and humans both show an attenuated fear extinction. In other words, adolescents less effectively extinguish their fear response than adults and children. Additionally, 
this is mitigated in adolescent mice when the fear extinction happens in the context in which the fear was acquired. So when the neutral cue is repeatedly presented in the same cage where the fear was acquired, adolescent mice normalize their extinction learning pattern and they that attenuated response no longer was present. This is relevant to a human clinical population because as I mentioned earlier, exposure therapy is the active ingredient of cognitive behavioral therapy for adolescent, for, excuse me, anxiety. And exposure therapy operates on the principles of fear extinction learning. Individuals are encouraged to repeatedly enter anxiety provoking situations and with repeated exposure, they eventually extinguish their fear response. They no longer experience the uh, situations as threatening or uncomfortable. Or, alternatively, they learn that they can tolerate the discomfort of being afraid. Their fear and arousal are often reduced. As the animal literature suggests, contextual learning is particularly important when we're thinking about exposure for adolescents. So realistic context is going to provide a more um, robust response for adolescents. And this is easy to do in a variety of anxiety disorders and related disorders and phobias, like let's say OCD, fear of contamination, or fear of dogs, because these uh, situations are easy to replicate in a therapy office. But with social anxiety disorder, it's difficult to replicate realistic context for exposure in a therapy office. Gathering a party of peers of one of our, our patients is not feasible to do in a therapy office. So virtual reality exposure therapy is a potential answer to this question. It uses virtual environments as realistic and immersive context for exposure. And there's a robust literature showing, as Dr. Hirschfeld mentioned, that uh, this can be very effective in a variety of anxiety and related disorders. However, it's not well studied in adolescents. So I'm going to talk about how my pilot study that's funded by BBRF is applying virtual reality to this problem. But first I'm going to take you through a model of social anxiety disorder and how it's maintained. So imagine Josh walks into a party. He sees a young woman who he doesn't recognize and he misinterprets a neutral look on her face as a look of disgust or rejection. He immediately starts to feel um, physiological symptoms of fear. He feels his heart racing, he starts to sweat as he is reminded of the experience that he had a few months ago when he was rejected by a young woman in front of his friends. His impulse is to avoid, so he goes into a corner and starts playing on his phone and he immediately feels a relief of his uh, physiological symptoms. And there also, unfortunately, is an absence of a corrective experience. He doesn't have the opportunity to extinguish his fear. In cognitive behavioral therapy, he would be encouraged to engage in gradual exposure, which means that he would, for example, be encouraged to make a few seconds of eye contact with a female peer or initiate a conversation with someone uh, who he feels comfortable with. With um, increasing difficulty of exposures and repeated trials, eventually he might experience extinction of his fear, or he would learn that he can tolerate the discomfort of being in an uncomfortable situation and still be able to function. The current study starts with an extinction computer task, which shows um, neutral shapes on a computer screen and pairs it with an aversive stimulus, which is a puff of air uh, to the neck. Um, and while the participants are engaging in this task, physiological indicators of fear are measured, galvanic skin response, heart rate, and heart rate variability. These indicators are also collected while the participants are wearing a VR headset and viewing an immersive three-minute clip of a social scene. And this is for us to assess whether or not we're correct in thinking that these immersive virtual environments are as physiologically arousing as real anxiety-provoking situations. Following this, this assessment, participants engage in cognitive behavioral therapy plus VR, where they learn a variety of coping skills to address these avoidant coping tendencies and engage in exposures in a virtual environment. They also have an opportunity to engage in um, rehearsal of skills in the virtual environment and also at home. After 10 sessions of 
of CBT plus VR, they engage in a reassessment of their fear arousal and extinction. So here's an outline of each study visit. We start with a clinical assessment that um, basically is a, a, psych, a structured clinical interview um, and includes self-report measures of anxiety, depression, and functional impairment, followed by the psychophysiological assessment. Um, at this point, the healthy controls who were included in the study as a comparison point for the physiological arousal assessment and the, the uh, extinction learning paradigm. They're finished with the study, and the 12 socially anxious participants go on to complete 10 sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy plus VR, and a post-treatment assessment, and then a three-month follow-up. So here's a short clip of a virtual party scene that's being used in this study. Come on in. I'm Marsha. What's your name? Nice to meet you. Make yourself at home. As you can see, the environment provides opportunity for exposure and also for rehearsal of skills. So the study is very exciting, but it's just the beginning. In the near term, if this pilot is successful, the next step would be a randomized clinical trial to establish, first of all, efficacy of the cognitive behavioral therapy plus VR, and also to further explore the neurobiological mechanisms of extinction learning and uh, the importance of contextual learning in adolescents with anxiety. In the longer term, if we find that this technology is useful to be integrated, then effectiveness trials establishing whether or not this is realistic to actually go into clinics in the real world and be used as part of cognitive behavioral therapy to enhance outcomes will have to be undertaken, and hopefully this will improve access to cognitive behavioral therapy to places where there aren't many well-trained clinicians. So with that, I want to thank you so much for having me, and I especially want to thank my mentors and collaborators on this grant, Dr. Shannon Bennett, Dr. Joanne Defeaty, Dr. Francis Lee, and Dr. John Walkup. Thank you.